and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank Mesut Bilgili also for organizing this webinar, for giving us the possibility to talk about Austria. Austria, which is a country everybody should know, but I don't think everybody knows very well here in Turkey. So my question is, do you know Austria? I suppose many know Austria by their music, Mozart, by skiing, and by the Sacher cake, which you have eaten perhaps. So this is what uh, Austria is very famous for. And uh, it's nice to have this picture of Austria, but actually this is only a small part of Austria. We see this clear stereotype when I ask people, what does Austria do except for tourism? And uh, nobody can really name any products from Austria. Can you? I will show you something. This is, for example, where I hear very often Red Bull. Yes, I've heard about Red Bull, but that's American, isn't it? And not many people know that each time you get on a plane in Turkey, you're eating Austro-Turkish food by Do & Co, which has a joint venture, which is, which is giving us, when we're allowed to fly, of course, outside the virus times, a very good food. And also the most beloved singer of the president of the US, she also wore robes or Swarovski crystals, where many say it's our Czech friends and um, uh, these are one of the few trademarks from Austria. But Austria is actually not famous for trademarks. That's true. What Austria does, it's a surprisingly ingenious country where we say that technology is very much inside. I just show you a few examples of projects in Turkey, because if you take the hydropower plants in Turkey, nearly all of them have some Austrian inputs. One example here, Andre Zydro, world leader in hydropower plants, turbines. But also when you get on a tram, you will not know that it's made in Austria, perhaps. Exactly the same with electricity. When you use it and you know these lines are going across the Bosporus, it's quite high tech to put those lines there. And again, it's an Austrian company who has done this. If you go in Istanbul from Taksim to Kabatas or on Uludağ going skiing, you will use Doppelmayr, which is a world leader for funiculars and skiing gondolas. So these are all things where you don't have to know they're Austrian. It's not a trademark for the consumer, but um, it's an Austrian technology. Again, something where we say in these products is always Austria inside. One of the leading companies in the world to develop world-class engines, ABL, they have also a big setup in Turkey. They are working on the engine so that they work better. If you have a kitchen at home or some other furniture, you will see inside it's Bloom. It's a world leader for cabinet hardware. If you go in a parking space, this is something nobody likes really. You have to pay money. So it's ski data or access to Austin companies, do the skiing areas, the access parking areas, AVMs and so on. Again, Austria, as we say, is inside. From my point of view, what is important here, I mean, these are all companies where I say, well, everybody could manufacture, but the actual point is that these companies could not survive if they would not invest very much money in high tech, in technology innovation. And that's the main thing. It looks like a simple product, but it has a high spending on innovation. Like Bloom, for example, they have each year hundreds of patents. And you'd say, why? It's a simple product. Well, it's not that easy. It is everywhere. Technology is not only high tech, it's inside all these products. And not only the Austrians are using it, but we can see that also foreigners are coming to Austria for this. And for example, the Chinese have opened their first R&D center outside of China in Austria. They must have a reason. The same is about the chip company Infineon. They're investing in a big factory. And by the way, we also have Austrian chip manufacturers who are quite successful. Again, it's the same slogan, Austria is inside. This is the point. So Austria is a strong economy, the heart of Europe. Yes, it has tourism. We are lucky to have a lovely landscape, but this is the same true for Turkey. But being a small country, the only thing we have is to see that we use our brains to try to develop products which we can sell worldwide. And you see the main point is to have a very high R&D quota of 3.90% is one of the highest in the EU. And my colleagues will tell you more about this chapter. But my point, which I'm trying to make is here, we have products which many people are using, but not many know they come from Austria. 
if we have a short view of the Turkish-Austrian foreign trade and relations, we can see that they have developed, developed quite well in the last 10 years, but they could be better. The red part is the Austrian exports to Turkey of goods and of services, and the green is the, Aust uh, the Turkish exports to Austria. You see, Turkey exports a little bit more, so Turkey doesn't have a trade deficit with Austria. But again, the question is for the Austrians. We said, do the Turks know Austria? I'm not sure, but do the Austrians know Turkey? They don't. It's the same story. Everybody thinks, well, we buy some oranges and some textiles, but it's not true. The main export product from Turkey to Austria is cars, automotive and machinery. And only after that you have textiles and in somewhere also the famous fruit and vegetables. So again, the Austrians will say, well, Turkey, I don't know much about it. I don't know that one of the biggest manufacturers of television sets, whiteware, they come from Turkey. And mostly when Austrian business people come to Turkey, they say, ah, it's quite different. I think that's important. It's in both directions. We have to get to know each other more. We have to see that we learn about each other. And then I think we can have more cooperation and we will have more foreign trade. I think there's scope for development. So about this entry, I just wanted to um, tell you a little bit about our two countries. I'm, of course, very willing to answer questions afterwards, but now let's concentrate on our subject, Technology Innovation and Industry 4.0. Austria today is home to a large number of companies with a very defined innovation concept, with a very defined innovation strategy. Um, of the about 400,000 companies in Austria, it's, um, there are about 10,000 who have uh, the dedicated budget that have dedicated staff for R&D. It's the people and it's the companies that make innovation in Austria work. We also have 23 universities that are engaged in basic research and in applied research. Austria has a GDP of approximately just barely under 400 billion euros. That's about just a little over half of what Turkey has. With, a, with this GDP, it's about 2.4% of the European Union or 0.4% of global GDP. But more importantly, Austria has a very high per capita income and that leaves as a strategic option only innovation because this way um, companies can aim for the higher market segment, can uh, acquire first mover advantages if they're innovative, on the, on the innovation landscape in Austria, you will see uh, that the, it, the whole countryside is, and this is the, the outline of Austria, is dotted with clusters of, of different uh, research and innovation capacity. Of course, you see in the upper right-hand corner, you see Vienna, which like uh, Istanbul or Ankara or Izmir, is one of the hotspots with uh, quite a number of universities. You then see uh, quite a number of uh, uh, yellow dots, which is life sciences and uh, health sector. You see quite a few of red dots, uh, which are essentially material science um, clusters. And then you see quite a bit in that are dark blue in mechatronics, electronics, and IT. Clusters are typically a form of cooperation between universities and uh, companies. You see the same. You see the same landscape, but with a different pattern. This is the. These are the patent hotspots, and you see that there are some areas quite outside uh, the, the the cities, which are very high in uh, patents per one hundred thousand inhabitants. With the dark blue one in the left corner, that's due to a metallurgy powder company that has a lot of patents, and this. Uh, dark one in the middle, the dark spot in the middle is the one uh, that is due to a number of machinery um, companies. Let me give you an idea of just how diverse the Austrian innovation landscape is. You may or may not have heard about Lisitz because it's not a consumer product company. It's a company in Amstetten that produces 
processing machinery for flat glass production. And you can imagine that all the high rise buildings that use flat glass need that type of equipment. And indeed, when asked Mr. Lee said, well, who is buying your equipment? He said, well, the companies that build flat to flat glass. And, but who are your clients? He said, everybody in the world who is uh, producing flat glass is, is buying Lizard's machineries um, with a very, very high share of the world market. Another company that you may not have recognized as an Austrian company is KTM Motorcycles um, or Wagner Bureau, the company that not only made the roof construction of the Sydney Opera, but also of the uh, Deutsche Bundestag in Berlin and uh, what the other image that you see is an uh, amusement park in Warsaw, or the company ZKOW, that is world leader in, in automotive lighting. These are the headlights of a modern car that move before, before you when you turn the steering wheel. The company in Wieselburg in Lower Austria. A few more examples. You may have heard of Inno Jembacher. This is a, a, a company that makes large engine, large gas engines uh, that are used, for example, in oil drilling to burn off, to, to burn or convert into energy, the gas that's being produced. Um, Chrysler Electronic is a company that builds battery management and battery packs for uh, electromobility. Uh, for example, you may uh, know that the A6 of Audi, for example, uses their package. And then a name that you may have become more familiar if you watch uh, Formula One races, Best Water Technologies, is a company in Monse, which is in, uh, very, very good in filtering technologies. Two more examples of that are just sort of off the wall is one is Medel, which is a medical product company. They do uh, aids for uh, implants for the hearing impaired, where there is some residual hearing uh, left cochlear implants, and they're a world leader in that area. And then there is TT Tech, which is a company that does highly safe uh, IT system, the kind of which you use, for example, in the Boeing 787 or in uh, automated pilot uh, cars that need to be very, very secure with high redundancy and the technology that keeps, just keeps IT systems very, very safe. Okay. How did Austria change the innovation habits of its uh, companies? It was a, must say, it was a long-term uh, program that started in the 2000s, in the early 2000s. And it was a priority set both by the social partners, the unions, the employers, and the government to do essentially seven things. And which is, one is develop the capacity for science and innovation including uh, innovation management skills in the companies, uh, develop an innovation base by getting more companies to, do, to, to invest in innovation, to get those that already are um, in innovation to do more in innovation, to have uh, start more demanding projects. Uh, and then of course, to build the labor force for uh, science and uh, technology at university and technical schools and to change the immigration laws to make it easier for researchers to come to Austria. Um, and then of course, try to become an integrated part of the European innovation landscape. And I will get to that in a little while. Cooperation is a big, uh, big um, uh, element, particular if you as a company uh, attend to innovation along the value change so you try to innovate with your customers, you try to innovate with your suppliers. This uh, graph just gives you an idea uh, what the investment looked like over the last few years, the dark blue part being the part paid for by companies. The gray part that sits on top of it is the foreign investment into R&D um, in Austria, but paid for by uh, foreign sources, particularly the companies that are internationally held, but do their R&D in Austria. And then this is an OECD graph that shows you about the mix uh, between 
the uh, direct aid by the government and uh, tax uh, breaks for uh, research and innovation. You can see that if you look about in the middle, you can see the graph for Turkey, which has a very, very similar distribution between direct and indirect aid to R&D as Austria. And you can see that initially at 2000, the, the, the year here uh, is uh, 2006, that from 2006, Turkey has increased considerably um, uh, its R&D expenditure um, and has, gained, has made ground here. Austria, as you said, has about the same distribution, a little bit, um, about half and half, uh, as far as direct and indirect government support for R&D is concerned. Um, here are the two main areas of providing uh, government funding for R&D. Um, one is direct aid, which is essentially project funding. Companies apply at uh, an agency called FFG, which is the Austrian equivalent to Tubitak, uh, but doesn't do its own research. It's just a funding agency and a, a kind of advisory service. And their project funding covers all technology areas, all phases of innovation and all sectors. It's, they have a broad funding toolbox that, uh, that uh, comprises grants and loans and, and, and networking and infrastructure investment. You name it, they got it in their toolbox and they were legally set up to have a wide range of instruments available. Um, they have a relatively quickly turnaround and they uh, are also the consultory service for Russian companies that try to apply for EU funding. And this is exactly what you see on this slide, 1.4 billion or one, almost 1.5 billion euros that flowed from EU money, EU funded projects into Austria over the last um, seven years. Is the variety of projects in the European Horizon 2020 with Austrian as well as uh, Turkish participation. Over the last seven years, there were a full 169 projects that had as well uh, an Austrian and a Turkish partner. Uh, Turkey being an associated country with the largest number of projects in secure, clean and efficient energy, 22 projects, 21 projects in ICT, um, then uh, 17 projects in small, smart, green and integrated projects, and then the remainder is uh, future and emergent technologies, seven projects, a secure society protecting freedom and security, eight projects, um, advanced manufacturing processes, six projects, uh, advanced materials, four projects, each with an Austrian and a Turkish partner in the same project. Last slide um, is uh, what you saw is, uh, is sort of a benchmark uh, how Austria is doing on the international innovation scale. All the factors that are green is where Austria is above the EU average. You can see that there is two areas where the concern venture capital, where we still have room to uh, improve. And the other one, uh, I can't read now, but um, you, see, you see that um, the EU terms Austria a strong um, innovator. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to briefly explain Industry 4.0. I would like to talk about the status quo in, in Austria and, and briefly also in Turkey about the challenges and opportunities. And then I would highlight some selected projects that we do in the national platform Industry 4.0 Austria. Um, first of all, I would like to start with uh, digitization is, is sort of changing the way we interact with each other and, and digitization industry 4.0 is really a game changer in many aspects and has also some social implication as this picture shows. But to be more serious, where do we stand? And you can see on the, on the left hand side um, a draft from the World Economic Forum and the blue button is Austria, the, the green button is Turkey, so we are ahead of the bunch of countries um, when it comes to industry 4.0. And on the right hand side, it's an OECD graph. And there you can see again that uh, Turkey on the blue, the blue dot and Austria red dot. And I think both countries are well prepared 
to embark upon Industry 4.0. Now, why we do we do we do that uh, Industry 4.0 from a macroeconomic level? We see that these countries that invest more in digitization and create the right framework conditions tend to be more competitive, and that is the left-hand um, graph, but also more productive, and that's the right-hand graph. And this is. Uh, this is one of the strongest implications for policymakers uh, to try to create the correct and right framework conditions. Um, I would like to very briefly explain what Industry 4.0 is all about. In principle, it's about digitizing the complete supply chain. Uh, and by doing so, um, there are several aspects that are relevant, but important is supply chain, meaning that it's cross-country issues. First of all, um, I always say we should differentiate between smart products and smart production. Um, I know a lot of companies that have very good and smart products, but they have a, I would say, outdated production line. So um, it's important to have these two in mind. Industry 4.0 in principle is connecting the real and the virtual world. One example from a company that um, produces cars in Austria is Magna and already back in 2008, um, they uh, developed and produced a car, it was a small Peugeot, um, and it was the first car in the world that was completely created virtually. Even the crash tests were all done virtually, and there was no need for any given physical prototype. And this is for me a very good example of the increasing importance of the virtual, virtual world. Um, I will come to that later again, but um, we see that there are a lot of new business models being created and developed around products and product related services. What is the key of Industry 4.0 when it comes to production is that work pieces and machines operate production autonomously and it's flexible and it's efficient, it's also resource efficient. And uh, recently I visited a, a, a factory, uh, it was um, uh, where they had several production lines and on one production line 250,000 different variants of a given product that could, could be produced and that is really a lot so you need a lot of flexibility and flexible flexible efficient means also that it's a decentralized um, um, method of, of doing um, production this is more a vision, but customer needs can be taken up by production in real time. You could not imagine it when you think about cars, but if you think, for instance, about golf bats, there you could use a 3D printer and you could have really in real time, um, the customer need maybe the size of, of the one who would like to play golf. So in, in some areas, this is already a reality. And last but not least, maintenance is regula re regulated autonomously and um, Predictive maintenance is one of the hottest topic, particularly in the machinery industry. When we talk about Industry 4.0, and, and this is very important for me, um, we talk about virtualization, as I said. What do we need for that? We need sensors and sensor systems because we need something to measure. Then we get data from sensor, and these data um, for, for these data, we, we need software, and therefore software engineering is important. Of course, these sensors are applied on machines, on equipment, so physical systems are important, and these together form these cyber physical systems. And cyber physical systems or cyber physical production systems are the core of Industry 4.0. Um, but that's not the end of the line. We also have work systems, and if, imagine if you have 250,000 different variants of a product being produced on one production line, you do need assistance systems for the workers, and that is exactly what is focusing when we talk about work systems. We talk about business models, and I come to that in a minute, and it's very important to, to have and keep this domain know-how. Many workers have a vast experience and many of uh, these workers do not know what they actually know so so trying to grasp this um, domain know-how is one of the key challenges uh, in, in, in industry 4.0 and basically we see three layers of motivation the first layer is and that is the origin of industry 4.0 to reduce costs and to improve efficiency uh, but there are two other dimensions as well and this is important because this layer tends uh, to um, 
<clears throat> to reduce jobs, but the other two layers, they rise jobs. The first one is, of course, you, you need to come up with new products. And we see that increasingly powerful tools and um, Georg Karabacek already mentioned AVL. They have a, a very sophisticated um, development platform where you can speed up development processes by shifting a lot of the R&D in the virtual world. And you have the new business models and the access to market. And these new business models as a key driver always have data. So it's data-driven business models uh, that makes this, the change to um, established business models. Um, I don't want to go into detail with that, but when you look at the different cost types, we can see a huge potential of Industry 4.0. If you put a sum, sum over all the potential, this is one of the reasons why, for instance, Austria, but also other countries like Switzerland, Germany, the Czech Republic, have a very high industry rate still, although it's a high cost and high income country like Austria. And that's that, uh, that's why we very much focus on Industry 4.0 because uh, it has a huge potential of improving the efficiency. Um, but there are also barriers, particularly for small and medium enterprises. One barrier, and I would like just very briefly talk about some of these barriers. One barrier is IT and data security. We see that also in Austria, but also in, under, in other countries, that operational technology, OT, in many cases, does not have any security whatsoever. And they perceive that IT is sort of a black hole and there needs a lot to be done. Um, then some companies perceive that uh, it needs high investment costs and there's unclear return on investment when it comes to Industry 4.0. And there was even an interview with a couple of company representatives and they thought that only after six years, they would get a positive return on investment when investing in um, digitization technologies. In reality, it looks the picture is completely different. We, we know of projects that within two, three, four weeks time, we already have a positive return on investment. Think of a sensor that might be applied to one machine and then you start um, experimenting with your data and trying to improve the efficiency of one company and then uh, you continue and attach more sensors to other machines. A big topic in Austria is the lack of qualified personnel. You need more and more well-educated people also in the production line. There's a fear of change among employees. Um, in many cases, uh, it's unclear which technology will be superior to others. So the technology development paths are unclear. There are several, um, for instance, several technologies when it comes to additive manufacturing, 3D printing, and it's not clear what could be the best solution for any given problem. But it could also be that uh, two years ago there was a hype on blockchain and now there's the hype ended a little bit, but there's a big hype on artificial intelligence. And all that means that companies would need to invest in these new technologies. And of course, it's very unclear which one of these technologies uh, would would be strong and would be helpful for the for the targets of the company and which not. And then, last but not least, there are unclear standards, and the, and and many um, companies are a little bit hesitant when it comes to using the cloud and putting data in the cloud. Now, I would like to just very briefly talk about the national platform industry 4.0, the who and the what. The who is um, and that is unique globally. Uh, um, I have six founding members, it's three employers associations, it's two employees associations, and it's one ministry. And, and what is remarkable is that from the very beginning, the trade unions are part of the game. And at the end of the day, this turned out to be very uh, a, a very good idea and, and uh, very constructive. The second square, these are the members of the platform. It's companies, multinational companies, Austrian companies and startups but it's also research institutions and some others. Um, and then we are in very close contact also with the regional provinces, with other ministries and, and other key actors in Austria. Um, and now about the what, and unfortunately it's in German, but I don't want to go into detail. What I would like to give as a message is that we look at Industry 4.0 from various angles. Of course, it's about technology, it's about re uh, research and it's about innovation. Um, and we have a focus on artificial intelligence. But we also look from the perspective of security, because that is one of the key drivers. We look from the perspective of new business models. We very much look at all the issues when it comes to qualification and competences. 
we track um, how the human um, um, feels in the digital factory and how the job profile changed due to digitization. Um, we are looking at norms and standards, and these are primarily um, global norms and standards uh, that are relevant. And we will now start a new initiative on resource efficiency. And the, the basic idea behind that is what contribution Industry 4.0 can give to climate change. And now I would like to just briefly explain some of our concrete projects in the platform Industry 4.0. Together with a couple of universities, we focused on predictive maintenance. And that's it started with how to sort data, how to clean data, and then start doing all the necessary measures when it comes to predictive maintenance. Um, we have two projects that are financed by uh, a digitization fund of the Federal Chamber of Labor. One is called AI for Good, and there we look at human-centered artificial intelligence. What are the success factors apart from technology that are relevant uh, so that companies can introduce successfully any given AI solution? Um, and we look at that quality assurance. And, and there are many, many aspects. And I would just say very briefly, when you think about AI as a co-worker, um, that is important. We have an interesting project on job orientation because uh, you can see that or we can see there are many new jobs and job, job profiles coming up because of the digital transformation. But many young people do not know of that. So we start a project where we have this orient, job orientation in the focus to have more young people um, studying uh, STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. As I mentioned already, we now focus on resource and energy efficiency. And there it's about three things, uh, to extract as little as possible from the earth, to put as little as possible into the, into the air, and to use as little soil uh, uh, as, as possible, and there Industry 4.0 can be a very strong partner. We know of one company in the Tyrol um, that wanted to build a new construction site, and because of Industry 4.0, they could optimize the existing production site such that there was no need to invest in a new uh, production site. Um, we very much think about 5G, the new telecommunication standard, and, and look at use cases, for, uh, particularly in production, because we believe that due to the increased use of and, and use of data and, and generation of data, 5G is one of the key technologies in the future. Um, we have published recently, uh, unfortunately it's in German, a, a draft on what are the most relevant standardization institutions in the world when it comes to the internet, to communication, to manufacturing and security. Uh, and in our perception, the most important ones, because there are many, many um, institutions that try to standardize something. And for many small and medium enterprises, it's completely unclear which of these standardizations um, will be successful and which not, and we would like to help them. Um, we also, in the, in the policy area, uh, we have a policy learning lab, and that's a project we have with partners from Germany, Italy, Poland, Hungary, Slovenia, and Croatia, where we exchange good practice when it comes to artificial intelligence, when it comes to new materials, when it comes to big data analytics, and also look at what, how to support best the digital transformation of small and medium enterprises. And last but not least, one project is about new business models, uh, and that is in that case um, data-driven business models. And one of the hottest topic currently is data sharing, also in the production environment, also in context of this European cloud initiative, Gaia X. Uh, and there um, um, we believe that sharing of data in the pro of production logistics might be uh, an element of disruptive new business model. Uh, disruptive new business models. So this is very short what we do, and I tried also to be um, to show what are barriers, but also what are the strengths of Industry 4.0. Thank you very much.